In 2015, Matthew Roberts was a US Naval Service member stationed on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt. The events that transpired during their 2015 workup cycle brought us the first ever declassified footage of unidentified aerial phenomenon and the New York Times article in 2017, Glowing Auras and Black Money, the Pentagon's Mysterious UFO Program, which was the first article that sparked the continuing interest in the mainstream media about UFO transparency. Subsequently, Matthew transferred to the Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington, D.C., where he began to have frequent and often intense personal experiences with the phenomenon. He discovered, through a long, painful, and sometimes terrifying journey, that the truth of the phenomenon has deep and profound implications for the future of the human race. It may seem like a bold statement, but the ultimate universal truth that underlies the phenomenon is captured in the simple yet eloquent words of Mark Twain. The two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. I wanted to get you on for a conversation because um, for me, you kind of exist within two worlds of the UFO issue. On one hand, you're one of the US Navy personnel who was you know, on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt uh, carrier in 2015 when the now famous gimbal footage was taken. So there is this aspect of your experience that has been uh, kind of like validated by the ongoing coverage of the UFO issue as it relates to incursions over sensitive training sites and facilities, all this kind of government stuff. But on top of that, you've you've gone down, well, you, you went down what would have to be kind of like, for lack of a better term, a kind of spiritual path or it's certain, certainly a consciousness related path. And at the very least, a feeling that you're taking part in some sort of initiatory experience and then you've written a book about that titled initiated and uh, and by the way for everyone listening links to matthew's book can be found in the description box below so you can check that out but um yeah matthew let's take this back to the beginning and work from there first of all can you expand on your military background what exactly was your role because i believe you told me when we had our little conversation that you had a background in intelligence right Yes. So, uh, you know, I was in the Navy for a total of 16 years um, and uh, I joined in 2004. Um, I became a cryptologist. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with what a cryptologist is, but uh, it's basically just, you know, computer speak and ones and zeros. And it's kind of boring, actually, but uh, it, it's a field within Intel. Uh, so that's what I was doing. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've done multiple deployments, um, done lots of ships, lots of sea time. Uh, so in, yeah, in 2015, you know, I was, I was, I was stationed on board the Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and we were doing our workups. Uh, it was just a normal workup cycle. Um, and then at the end of that, uh, that was when, you know, this, this event um, occurred with the gimbal footage. Dude, that is a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, I think, dude. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not. That is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's a like that thing, it's rotating. And, uh, you know, that was a, uh, that was a, like a three or four day event. It wasn't just a one-off. Um, they came back, you know, every night for uh, four nights. Um, and I was first alerted to something happening because we had finished our section of the uh, of the workup cycle. So we're, we're basically being tested. So I had uh, someone in my space uh, that the, the space that I worked in on the ship and she was, you know, putting us through these tests um, to see how we would respond to various situations and stuff. And um, 
so we had finished our portion and I was just kind of sitting back waiting for our grade um, when a buddy of mine who works in Intel in another shop came in and he said, hey, you know, check this out. So <laughs> we all gathered around my computer and I kind of pulled it up. And that was when I saw the gimbal footage for the first time in 2015. And um, we were all kind of, you know, just taken aback by it. I, I found that I had some kind of remo oh, emotional reaction to it. Um, I'm sorry, were you going to ask a question? No, no. All I was going to say was, uh, but I think you might have already answered this on record before, is the video that came out publicly the same length, the same level of detail as the video that you initially saw when you first when you first got eyes on it? It is, yeah. yeah. It, it's the same, the exact same video. Um, I know a lot of people like to think that maybe there's a longer clip, <laughs> and that that may be true. I, I don't really know. Yeah. Um, so but how many the, but how many uh, personnel were with you watching the video for the first time what was what was the reaction of the room like um so we were just all kind of uh, there was probably about seven of us you know mm. gathered around this computer <laughs> and uh we were just we just watched it and we were like what is that you know that is the craziest thing we've ever seen um and i think i even turned to the guy next to me who had who had brought it to my attention and i'm like what is is that you know is this this oh, is the this is the kind yeah. of saucer shaped one it, it looks like, kind of like a saucer doesn't it it's got that uh, strange uh, shape yeah. to it with like a bulge in the middle yeah and you can you can hear the the pilots talking and they say it's rotating yeah yeah, yeah yeah that's that's the that's the footage the other f bit of footage that i saw at that time was um the go fast footage those were both from um this same event So yeah, I mean, um, you know, he told me a little bit of the background of what had happened, um, which I, I can't really get into here, but uh, I don't know, maybe someday. <laughs> maybe well, we, someday. Know, we, know the, we know that there was uh, a, like a, apparently a fleet of these things, right? That the, yeah, the, cam yeah. the camera's recording what might be classified as the mothership, like some sort of primary yeah. object, but then there was apparently a whole fleet off the, off the camera. Yeah, and I mean, and I had reason to believe that there was more than just one. Um, I, I kind of knew that there was more than just one and that this was uh, kind of a, a bunch of them that were flying around. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I watched the footage and I was like, wow, this is incredible. You know, and I found that like I was unable to eat for several days afterwards. I just had kind of totally lost my appetite. And, you know, as, as time went on, I started to feel this paranoia set in um, and this just dread. I got this feeling that they were there for me and that someone was going to find that out, <laughs> which, of course, is nuts. Yeah. I, mean, I even thought at the time, I don't know why I'm feeling this. This is not right, right you know, <clears throat> but that's that's the way I felt. And um you know, I was going to a brief one day and there were a couple of pilots and they were discussing it on either side of a doorway. And I just kind of, they were talking about it. And one of them said, hey, did you see the UFO footage or whatever? And the other one's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just kind of, you know, I threw my head down at the floor and I just darted past them. I wanted nothing to do. Really didn't want to that. think about it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you know, and so we went on deployment after that. And um, they came back um, while we were on deployment on station. So, you know, there's a lot of people that like to say, well, this is ours. We're testing it. We're testing our own craft on our own people. And it's just, it wouldn't happen that way. Because you wouldn't, first of all, you wouldn't, I, I've been in situations like this where we test equipment. And you don't test it on people who don't know what's going on, first of all. You know, everyone's informed as to what's happening. Um, but then second of all, you wouldn't put this 
equipment that you're testing now in like a live fire situation you know because was, you was there jet... actually was there actually any ordinance on board during the training scenarios not not during the training scenarios but uh certainly when we were on station the yeah. jets that were taking off were were loaded with weaponry yeah you know yeah. and so to put this now in in that situation is dangerous you know um absolutely so so it's just it's just absurd that people have this opinion that this is us testing our own equipment. It, we wouldn't test it that way. It just doesn't happen that way. I guess I have to play. I have to play devil's advocate just just because there are opinions in the community. And to be fair, even uh, you know opinions that have been shared to me by certain people within uh, you know the intelligence community that if you were if you were going to and this was actually more to do not with the gimbal but with the tic tac uh, which all happened during training scenarios where there was no ordinance uh, and no you know risk of a live fire was that if you were going to test a, an extremely exotic you know classified platform it, and you wanted to test it against the most powerful kind of surface white world military force available to you which would be the US navy then you would do that during training workups where there's no risk of a live fire. And like you said, obviously, the, you know, people would normally be informed just playing devil's advocate here. But if it was something so black budget and secret, but they wanted to test it against the capabilities of their of their surface level, uh, you know, uh, equipment, maybe that's the way you would do it is you just drop it in there and be like, oh, it's a UFO. We don't know what that is. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I, I, I get that. But I, you know, like I said, I've been involved in these types of tests, right? You know, where we test technological readiness tests stuff. Yeah. And, and maybe not everyone in the ship is informed, mm. but the people certainly who need to know, know what's happening. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And, and the rest of the ship just knows, okay, we're doing some kind of testing. So there might be some unusual things, but mm. So, so I mean, I like it, that that I have been involved in that, and and that's how it always goes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just I just don't buy it. I don't <laughs> buy it. <laughs> no, I, I understand. But um, to get into to get into some of the other elements of this, because this this is inevitably going to go down quite an interesting journey. Whilst we have this discussion, you have this experience. You obviously reacted to it quite intensely. Um, it had a real effect on you. What happened next? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I, I just kind of put all of it in the back of my head um, for a few years because I, you know, I, I, I figured that, you know, this footage is never going to see the light of day. Right. And, and whatever program this is that handles this, I'm not read into it. So I'll never know, you know, so I just kind of was okay with that. And, um, you know, I, for couple of years it was just kind of in the back of my head kicking around can i jump in real quick did you what did you yeah. uh tell family or friends or anyone after the event no. or did you keep it to yourself you kept it to yourself i kept it to myself yeah. yeah yeah i mean i i i never spoke to my family about my job at all right um whatsoever they had no idea what i did they knew i was a cryptologist but it was never something i discussed at all right um so i mean you know when I did transfer to the Office of Naval Intelligence next, I, you know, I, I had told a couple of coworkers about that experience when I got there, just to kind of, cause I kind of wanted to see, does anyone around here know, <laughs> know about this, you know? Uh, and, and, you know, everybody just kind of thought it was a weird thing and th that was it, you know? And then, uh, you know, I was, at home and my brother texts me one night and he texts me about this ufo article in the new york times you know and um and there's footage that's been released he says you know so so i i clicked on the links he sent me and i was like oh my god i can't believe this you know mm -hmm. now all of a sudden this footage that i saw in a skiff um for the first time i'm now watching it on my cell phone you know and that was just such an alien thing to me um and it felt so wrong you know like i this shouldn't be happening you know <laughs> but i read the article and you know the uh i saw harry reed was quoted in the article they talked about ttsa 
And so I thought, you know, this is, it's got to be some kind of legitimate release. So my brother calls me and he's like, oh, have you, you know, have you ever seen anything like that? And I kind of choked a little bit because yeah, you're like, <laughs> uh, I was actually there when this thing happened, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I choked because I, I didn't want to talk to him about it. Right. I don't yeah. talk about work, you know, yeah. and I, that's just been so deeply ingrained in me that you just don't talk about these things. And so I, I really didn't want to have the conversation, but seeing as how like people like Harry Reid were quoted in this article and it's the New York Times, I thought felt well, a little more confident. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, you know, I was there when this was collected. Um, and he just kind of, the line went dead. He was, he didn't know because suddenly now it's real, you know, yeah, not only right. is it in the New York times, but I was there and I'm telling him, yes, this is real, you know? And, um, you know, so we just kind of left it at that. And I, I decided, well, I want to kind of get to the bottom of this. I want to know more, you know? So, I looked at TTSA and the people that were associated with it to try and find books that people had written that were associated with it. And that was when I read, you know, Hunt for the Skinwalker by right. Colm Kelleher. Um, and then I read Tom DeLonge's books and I read some Jacques Vallée. And just to be clear, you weren't really involved in the UFO research or anything like that prior to your experience or anything? No, no. no. And I, you know, and I, I was never a real big UFO guy. Mm any of this happened you know i would i would see like ancient aliens would come on tv and i would change the channel you know it was <laughs> it was not something i was interested in and i i just didn't care i thought it was all you know tinfoil hats you know um so yeah so i i started reading these books to try and get to the bottom of this and um that was when things really started to get weird for me um so, so I read all these books and then I reached kind of as an, as a trained analyst, you know, I reached what I thought was the end of my credible sourcing, you know, because right. I, I had run out of books to read basically. Um, so I thought, well, I'll just have to wait for more stuff from the TTSA, you know, to come out about this. But, um, but Hunt for the Skinwalker was a pretty creepy book you know, and for that to be associated with these people from the Pentagon, mm. for me, it, it held a, le a level of credibility. It was like, know? well, yeah, if they're looking into this, then surely there's got to be something <laughs> to UFOs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so I, I you know, I, I, I thought it was creepy, but then I was like, you know what, I kind of accept this because it's associated with these people mm. and these people are people that I would trust, you know, I would trust their opinion. So, uh, you know, I, I, I thought, well, I don't want to wait for more information to come out. And there was one of Tom DeLonge's books where he leaves it kind of a cliffhanger. They find these ancient tablets that are. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. I was like, well, you know, let me figure out what what are those tablets? What are, what are they going to be in the next book? So I start looking up tablets and I come across um, the Emerald tablets. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and. And I, you know, it seemed kind of interesting to me. And I, I read, you know, the translation of the Emerald Tablets by Isaac Newton. I was like, oh, Isaac wow. I didn't even know that that happened. Yes. He, he, there is a translation by Isaac Newton. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm going to have to find that. <laughs> yeah. And I, at first, that was my reaction. I was like, oh, this is just some internet conspiracy theory nonsense. Yeah. But then I looked it up. There's a university website where they actually have his handwritten translation um and so i was like wow this is if you can uh, okay. if you, if, have you got a link or anything that you could send me and i'll put it into the description box for people or yeah yeah i'll find it i'll find yeah. it um cool so i thought you know why would isaac newton be looking at something like this you know and and then it talks about hermetic teachings so i was mm -hmm. like well let me look up, uh, look up hermetic teachings see what this is all about and i came across this book called the Kabbalion. Mm -hmm. i'm not sure if you're familiar with it Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh, by the three initiates. That's the one. 
Yeah. So I I read I, I read the description of that and I thought, you know, that just seems a little bit too out there for me. I'm not gonna read that. <laughs> yeah. You know, because it, it and I read that, you know, the, the biggest p- problem that people have with it is that it says that there's no such thing as coincidence, right? Mm. Everything happens for a reason. And that uh because of that, it seems to imply that we have no free will, mm. you know, and so people have a, a big problem with that. And so I was like, you know, I'm definitely not reading that book. So I, 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 um, I started looking up, maybe there's a MUFON chapter near me that I can get involved with. And I couldn't find anything that had posts that were not a decade old. So I was like, well, that's a dead end. I guess, I guess that's it. You know, I'll just have to wait for more from TTSA. Uh, but then, you know, so I, I went to bed that night. The next morning I got up and I had to drive down to Pax River, which is like an hour and a half south of D.C., and then drive back, you know, that same day. So um, I went into work that morning and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to go down to Pax River. I'll be I won't be back until after lunch, obviously. So I drive down there and I'm, I do what I have to do. And then I'm on my way back. And um, all of a sudden, this little hatchback like cuts me off. And on the back window is this sticker that says MUFON Maryland, find us on Facebook. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, that's why I didn't find anything about them last night, because I don't have Facebook, you know, <clears throat> being in Intel, it was just, I was never comfortable having a Facebook page. So I didn't do social media. So just then I realized I'm passing this Hobby Lobby, which is like a chain of arts and crafts stores here. Um, and uh, I, I there was this big Supreme Court decision involving that chain of stores. So it, it kind of made a note of it in my mind. And I'm, I'm following this hatchback and I thought maybe I'd get out and talk to this guy if he if he stops, you know, but he was, he was like really zooming and going faster than I was willing to go. So, (laughs) so I just, I just, I was like, ah, forget it. You know, and I went home that night. Um, It's just kind of a normal day after that. Um, I was getting ready for bed and I'm headed up the stairs to go to my room and my roommates, you know, sitting on the couch um, watching TV. And so I had to kind of walk in front of the TV to go up the stairs to go to my room. And um, he said, all of a sudden he stops me. He's watching like CNN, the talking heads uh, on the news, uh, political news. And he's, he says, you know, you know what's wrong with these Republicans? And I said, no. He's like, you know what all this is about? And I was like, no. He's like, Hobby Lobby. It's about that Hobby Lobby decision that allowed all this corporate money into campaigns. And so he goes off on this tangent about Hobby Lobby, right? (laughs) So I kind of talked to him about it for a minute. And then I go up to my room and I start thinking to myself, you know, this is a huge day of coincidences, right? Like the the MUFON, I looked up MUFON last night, that hatchback, it cut me off. And then my roommate mentions Hobby Lobby, which I was passing at the time. And so I started to think, well, this is crazy. And then my heart started pounding, right? And I thought, okay, this is weird. You know, it's, it's like kind of that kind of pounding you get when you have a, a rush of adrenaline, mm-hmm. but I didn't feel any adrenaline. It was just pounding. And then I felt this urge to get in my car and go drive. And I thought, okay, this is really strange. I've never felt the urge to go drive before, you know? So I, uh, I kind of sat on my bed and tried to wait, see if it would go away and it didn't. Um, so I said, well, you know, it's like 11 o'clock at night by this point. I thought, well, let me just do this. I'll, I'll go for a drive and I'll see that this is just some stupid thing that's all in my head, you know? So I get down to my car, uh, and I, back out of the three point turn to get out of the driveway and I put the car in drive and I'm sitting there and I think to myself, I can't do this. You know, it's 11 o'clock. I got to go to work tomorrow. Um, This is all in my head. And if I keep this up, I'm going to be in a straight jacket before long, you know, (laughs) to go on these wild goose chases in the middle of the night. 
And so I said, you know, I'm just going to pull back into my spot and go to bed. And when I just then I felt like this, I, this incredible feeling of like, I, I can only describe it as like electrocution. I felt like this buzzing through my body that it was like I was attached to a light switch and someone just flipped it. And as I was feeling that, my hands turned the wheel towards the road and my foot stepped on the accelerator and I wasn't doing that. Oh, wow. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, that happened and then it shut off. And then I was like, I was in a panic, all out panic now because it was like, okay, this isn't in my head anymore. I've never been able to induce that feeling in myself. And I had been reading these books by valet that talk about this kind of thing. And so now I'm like really panicking, you know, I'm like, what is going to happen to me now? Um, and so this feeling to drive was mixed with like this intense, you know, go now. It was like a urgency, you know? And so I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to go. Uh, and we'll see what happens. Um, but, I, you know, I'm a mess at this point. I'm like crying because I'm thinking, am I going to get abducted now? What the hell is going on? You know, um, so I figured, you know, I'd drive down to Pax River because that's where I was earlier. So just before the freeway, there's this gas station. And I thought, well, I don't know how long this is going to take. I'm going to grab a drink real quick for the road. So I, I parked at one of the pumps out front and um, I, this feeling washed over me that whatever I had to leave the house to do was going to happen right here at this gas station. And uh, that was really uncomfortable for me because I thought, you know, how could that be? This was just like a last minute decision to pull in here um, and grab a drink. But uh, you know, there it was. And I, I was starting to feel this urgency and this need to get out of the car. So I, I'm looking around to see, you know, what, what's going to happen here at this gas station in the middle of the night near the freeway. Nothing good, I'm sure. <laughs> you know. So I, you know, I'm scanning the front of the gas station. I'm looking at the intersection behind me. And, I, and then all of a sudden, right in front of me, I see it right? There's these people sitting at this table out front. And um, there's a homeless man. And he's sitting with these two women that are like immaculately dressed. And I thought this is very much out of place, you know, um, at this gas station in the middle of the night. I mean, it was a bad part of town. There's like garbage rolling around the parking lot in the wind. Um, and these two immaculately dressed ladies are sitting with this homeless man eating. <laughs> Can you remember so, what they uh, what they look like specifically? Yeah, so you know they they kind of look like the women that I work with at O and I. Like they look like they were about to go brief Congress or something. That's how <laughs> professionally business attire they were, you right. know. And their hair was immaculate, makeup immaculate. They had jewelry on and they were clearly very comfortable there. And, and I the, thought and the this... person they were with was very rough looking, like obviously yeah. homeless. Yeah. He, I like as, so I get out of the car and I'm walking and I, I see that this guy's got like grass in his hair and his clothing is just caked with filth. Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, and his jeans are shredded around his ankles. He's just in bad shape, you know? So I got this feeling that I was supposed to hear what they were talking about. So as I'm walking past them, uh, there were, one of them was African American and the other one seemed to be Latino. And uh, the, the black woman holds up her hand and she says, you see, she says, there's no such thing as coincidence. Everything happens for a reason. She said, I never sit at places like this, but some, something told me to sit here tonight. And, you know, I'm like weak kneed and I, I'm, I'll walk right past them into the gas station to grab my drink. And I was like, I started thinking to myself, no way did that just happen. And she, did no. she say that to you? She was, was saying that to the, 
to the homeless man that was sitting across what? from her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought there no way did that lady just say that, you know, because all of these coincidences that led me to this gas station in the middle of the night told me that I had to read this book, The Kabbalion, you know, basically. You know, I had decided last the night before that I wasn't going to read it. And the universe was like, no, you're really going to read this book and you're going to read it tomorrow, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, you know, I, I, I thought to myself, you know, this as I'm standing there getting my drink, I thought, you know, this has got to be it because I can't handle any more tonight. You know, this has just been the craziest day I've ever had, you know, and this feeling washed over me that, oh, you know, you got it. You got what you were supposed to get and this is going to be it. And so I, I just, uh, I left the gas station and I thought, you know, maybe I should join this conversation out front because this is what's going on here, you know, <laughs> But then, you know, as I'm passing them, <clears throat> I could hear that the, the two women were talking about God. And I was like, oh, this, I'm an atheist. This is not a conversation that I want to be a part of, you know, so I just left. Um, and uh, so I went home that night and I went to sleep and I got up the next morning and went to work. And I'm just all day, I'm thinking to myself, what was that? You know, what the hell happened last night? And, a, and I knew no, go yeah, on, go I, on. I, I knew I couldn't tell anybody about it because they'd think I was crazy, right? <laughs> and yet and yet it happened, you know. So I was like, well, when I get home, I'm gonna look this book up and crack it open, you know. And so my what I did actually is I went home and there's an audio version of the book by Andrea Fiore on um on LibriVox, and that's that's what I, I listened to the audio version. And I find that uh, it, it's, it's kind of a difficult read. It's, yes. I, I find it's easier to listen to than to read it, you know. Um, but, you know, it goes into these seven universal principles that govern the universe. And, um, and when I got to the principle of mentalism and it talks about how you can think about the universe as a mental creation and, and that there's this singular consciousness that created all of it. Um, and I just started thinking to myself, this is so crazy. This is like, they're implying that there's a, a God, a creator, you know? And um, that was something that I had a really hard time accepting mm. um, because like I said, I was an atheist before I never believed any of that. total confrontation to your to your worldview at the time yeah yeah it was but uh but at the same time i thought you know i can't just dismiss that anymore mm. because of the extraordinary means by which i came across this book <laughs> you know it was just impossible um so you know i thought you know i i read the kabbalion several times and I thought to myself, okay, if this is like some kind of learning experience for me, then I'm ready for more experiences from which I can learn. And that was my thought after reading it several times. And uh, of course, nothing could have been farther from the truth. I was not in any way prepared for what happened to me next. Um, and uh, that that the next experience was just... It was, it was what really just sent me into this, like this really dark place, you know, because as scary as this Kabbalion um, incident was, it was nothing, <laughs> nothing compared to, um, to what happened to me next. Um, so like I was, I was in bed one night and um, I was asleep and uh I felt something grab my arm, um, you know, kind of right here, uh, just below my shoulder. And uh, I woke up and I was on my back in my room. And I thought that initially I thought, well, I, I had snored myself awake because I, I sleep on my stomach because if I sleep on my back, I'll snore. Um, 
and so I'm looking at, you know, the window off to my left and I'm looking at the trim around it and suddenly it starts to get blurry, you know? And so I tried to lift my hand to my face to kind of wipe the sleep out of my eyes and it just flopped at my side. And I was like, I can't move, you know? And then I looked down and the comforter was not on me anymore. And I was like, I remember going to sleep with a comforter on me. <laughs> so this is weird. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, I woke up because there's someone grabbing my arm. Um, and I could still feel their hand there. Uh, so I, you know, being having this paralysis, I, um, I kind of fought to turn my head to the right to see who was standing there. And it was just so slow and just agonizing to try and get my head over there. Um, but my, as I'm turning my head, my room is getting blurrier and blurrier and kind of darker. And uh, I just see this shadow standing over me, these two arms, a torso and a head kind of leaning into me. Uh, and I, as I'm looking at this, all of a sudden, like this light starts to light up behind this entity. And it's like this golden light and it just starts to just become very bright and it gets so bright that it's almost like blinding. And then all of a sudden this light concentrates into like rays of golden light coming out of its head. And, and then like, I see this face appear it's, and it looks like there's a, like a tablet in front of this entity's face. And it's switching through photographs of people that I know. Um, and then it stops on the image of an ex of mine from like 20 years ago. And I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm like, what is going on? You know? And I, so I start to fall back asleep uh, and I can't stay awake. And then all of a sudden I'm having like this sexual dream between me and my my ex from 20 years ago and it's it's kind of a weird dream because we're it's like me and my ex and we're surrounded by nothing right just pitch black there's no wall no floor no nothing uh but then i start to wake up and i'm back in my room and i can see that this there's a female on top of me um my hands are on her thighs and i can feel her skin it's much thicker uh and smoother than normal human skin and she's got blue skin in fact and um as this is happening I, I i understand what this is you know i'm i'm thinking to myself this is she's not human you know there must be some craft parked in the backyard right now or something because she is not from here you know um so I start trying to scan up towards her face and her face is just blurred out. I can't see anything about her face. I can just see this large black mass surrounding what I assume is her head uh, right there. And it's just all blurred out. Um, but she was wearing this top. Um, it was like a tank tube top or something. And uh, <laughs> You know, and uh, it seemed to be made out of like some kind of metal or precious stones or something because it was just kind of glistening in the light. Um, and so like this went on and on and I was in and out of this dream state uh, and seeing her on top of me. And I was like, I can't believe this is happening. This is crazy, you know. Um, but then, she, you know, was, I, was she just on top of you or was she actually, were you, were you having sex? Yes, she was, she was, it was, I was naked and she was having sex with me. Wow. Okay. Um, and so I, you know, obviously, you know, I finished and she, I woke up in my bed the next morning and I was, I was just thinking to myself, what? happened last night you know i felt sick i felt just disgusting um you know and i went down to my truck and i started smoking a cigarette and i was just like what 
what does this even mean? You know, it, uh, what, what is this about? <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I, I started to remember, you know, how when I was younger, I would have these types of dreams where I would feel paralyzed, you know, and I would be like struggling to move. And I, I as a kid, I thought that these were just dreams. But in light of this experience, I was like, wait a minute, this has been going on my entire life. I've been having these experiences, you know, where I wake up with this paralysis. There's someone there, you know. Um, I have so, to, I have to be the, uh, the just, just for the thoughts of people listening, uh, the devil's advocate. Have you, have you, uh, you know, been to the doctors to see if you've got any sort of issues that might precipitate uh, par sleep paralysis or anything like that? Uh, well, not, not specifically sleep paralysis, but, um, you know, I, I have been to the doctor and, you know, they've, they've done scans of my head um see if maybe you know blood clots or something and there was not there's nothing there nothing they there. couldn't find yeah. anything so no, i think there's <clears throat> i think there's more of a mystery to sleep paralysis than people fully understand but obviously a lot of people will uh kind of go oh it was just a vivid dream it was just a vivid right. sleep paralysis induced dream but i mean what would your response be to to that kind of idea uh my response to that would be that you know this was not something that I expected or mm. wanted or would have even imagined, right? Like this whole light show. It's pretty wild. Yeah. Like the next morning being an atheist, I was like, what does this mean? You know, because to me, when I started thinking about it, I was like, that looks like religious art that I've seen from all over the world, right. you know, with the divine entity that has this light coming yeah, from the yeah, head like kind of aura around them. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, this has been going on for a long time, whatever this is. Um, and this was kind of like what got me started on this path towards like mythology and um, trying to see where, where is this in our past as human beings, you know? And I, I started to realize that this goes back really far. Uh, you know, you've got cave paintings of early man that to kind of depict this kind of thing and uh that's like hundreds of thousands of years you know and it's just that to me that is crazy you know that mm. that is amazing as well because this has been going on that long um so i knew that there had to be more to this experience than i currently understood and i thought well i need to understand this um and I knew that what was happening to me was significant. Um, so I, I, like I said, I felt this deep, just really dark depression setting in. And um, I didn't know where that was coming from. I, I didn't understand it because I wasn't, I mean, there was nothing. It seemed like there wasn't anything that necessarily precipitated that, but, uh, but it was there and it was intense. Uh, and I, I didn't know what it was. Uh, so, so this went on for months, months with this depression. I would come home from work. I would lay on the floor of my bedroom, just like shaking and shivering and crying. And my teeth would be chattering. It was that bad. Uh, and, you know, all the while I'm having like crazy nightmares. Uh, I, I had nightmares where my parents were being hacked to death with an axe um i had nightmares of like i had one nightmare where i was like <laughs> i was running around my house looking for a weapon to defend myself with and i stopped in front of this tv screen and i saw like these riots happening in washington dc and there were burning cars and then the camera pans around to like the white house lawn and there's like people hanging from nooses in the trees uh, it was just, it was awful. And I, I would wake up just, you know, covered in sweat. Um, like, like I had just been standing in the shower is what it was like. And I remember one time I got up and I turned on the light and I looked back at my bed and I could see this just sweaty outline of me, <laughs> you know, on my bed. And I was like, this is 
nuts, you know? Uh, so, so that keeps going on. And all the while, like twice a week, I'm having these experiences where I wake up and I feel that that same heaviness and then I'll see my comforter like thrown off of me and there's someone behind me uh, and I'll hear this female voice say, shh, don't be afraid, you know? And then like I would fight to stay awake and I would usually just drift off back to sleep as I would feel my body like sliding across the bed towards the wall. Um, so I knew that they were taking me a couple of times a week and I wasn't sure what for because i never remembered it um but but um they were uh so you know i got to this point where i i was like well you know this guy who wrote the Kabbalion, he must have written other books i've got to look at these other books so i started reading his other books um and i came across this woman mabel collins that also published underneath the same publishing company um that belonged to William Walker Atkinson. And so I read her book called Light on the Path. Uh, I don't know if you, have you heard of these I'm, books? I'm familiar with it, but I haven't read it. Yeah. And, um, and so I'm reading Light on the Path and uh, this other book she wrote called Our Glorious Future. And like, they just kind of brought tears to my eyes because I, I was like, these books are like about me. This is my philosophy in a book. I know <laughs> that know? feeling, you know, and uh, so I was like, wow, this is incredible. And and it was like light on the path seemed to be these steps in a process to something, you know, and I didn't I didn't really know what that I was like, is this a process? Am I in a process? What's what's happening here? And I just really didn't understand. Um, so I. I just continued because I. I think a lot of people where they get messed up in this experience is they'll start to feel this depression set in and they'll do anything to distract themselves from it. Right. They, they just get out of it because they assume that it's something bad. Um, they assume that this depression is a bad thing. Um, and I think that's where they go wrong because they take themselves out of the initiatory process. Um, and I, I've since read a lot of stuff to do with alchemy that talks about how um, like um, a feeling of melancholy that sets in is like the ideal state, you know? And I'm not sure what it is about that. I, I've, I've kind of looked into it a little bit and there's something about neuroplasticity and depression, how it right, improves right. neuroplasticity. And one of the books that I came across by William Walker Atkinson, it, uh, it's called A Series of Lessons in Raha Yoga. And each chapter gives you a mantra to repeat. Uh, and so I started repeating and meditating on those mantras. Um, and, you know, of course, there were lots of other things that happened. Uh, I don't know how much of the interview <laughs> we want to take up. With well, that. hey, look, man, I'm happy to go for as long as you want to. I, I, I just, I'm enjoying listening to this story because it's the first time I'm ever hearing it. So, yeah. uh, you know, you just, you just take me down wherever you want to go. I'll jump in every now and then. But, um, you know, whatever okay. you, whatever you want to talk about. Okay. Um. Yeah. So, like, I got to this point though where I was like kind of angry about all of this. Right. And I wanted answers. I wanted to know why they were doing this to me. And so I drove out to this high school, this school campus where I had volunteered for this special Olympics like a week before. And uh, it was out in the, uh, the reason I chose this because it was out in the middle of nowhere. Like there was nothing around it. So I, I drive out there kind of looking for answers. And I, I knew that they must have been watching me, you know. Uh, since I was a small child, so they would know I'm driving out there. Um, but of course, like I sat there and nothing happened and I was just so angry. You know, I was just furious that they were doing this to me. Um, but so I'm, I'm driving back and I'm like, you know, let me put on some music. I want something to take my mind off of this because I don't want to think about it anymore. So I turned on the music and 
uh, it seemed like every song was like a poor you kind of song. And so I'm switching channels <laughs> and, and then I come across this song that starts off with these birds and bells and I change the channel and it's, it's on the next channel as well. And it seemed to be on every channel. So I oh, just wow. shut it off. I shut it off. I was like, I'm not playing, you know? <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I get home, uh, the next day I'm talking to my brother about this stuff a little bit. Uh, and he kind of convinces me that there's gotta be something more that I'm missing. Um, so I'm like, yeah, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe this is something more significant. Um, and I need to just kind of stick with it. Uh, so that night, you know, I'm sitting there and I, I turned on the music in my truck as I'm having a cigarette. And uh, this song comes on, um, Where is the Love by the Black Eyed Peas, you know? And I never listened to music, uh, but I, I remember I had, hear, I had heard this song when I was younger and I was like, oh, I kind of like this song. So I pulled it up on YouTube on my phone and I listened to it. And I knew that YouTube would play the next song automatically. And I said, okay, well, if there's no such thing as coincidence, then the next song that comes on should be significant, right? So <laughs> drum roll. <laughs> right. I let it finish. And then all of a sudden I hear this song with it starts with these birds and these chiming bells, uh, right? Okay. Yeah. And I was like, no way. And so I pick up my phone and I was like, this is that song that I heard that night. I went out looking for answers. And it was it was Coldplay's "Hymn for the Weekend." Oh yeah, and it's it starts off um, with the words like "angels sent from up above." And I'm watching this, and I'm like, "No," I was like, "No, that is not what this is. That's that's not what this is." You know, being an atheist, I just I don't want to believe that. Um, but you know, then I remember like, no, you know, you saw that whole light show and that's like in all the religious art all over the world. Um, also just, uh, I mean, like, you know, the, the thing that gets me because I, uh, different storyline, but similar path of coincidences and synchronicities on my side of this, right. Which is why I've got this whole platform. It's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, but what, what really gets me is it's like, how, you know, is this just extraterrestrial? What has the ability to actually put placeholders into your life that you actually recognize and pick up on, and, and it it becomes coincidental? And it that that's yeah, that's not just technology. That's that's the ability to kind of almost twist the path that you're going on and place things into it. I mean, what you know, what what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I I know what you're talking about. Because, Do you know what I mean? You know, it's, it's hard to describe. Yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you know when I started having these experiences, and then I, I I look back on my childhood and stuff, I had remembered at the time that those things happened. You know, as some of them, I even remembered thinking I should remember this because this is going to be something. Oh, okay. Mm, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I and I don't know why I did that. Why I thought to myself I should remember hmm. this. Hmm. you know, but I did. <laughs> and then sure as hell, you know, later on in life, it pops yeah. up and it's like, that was significant. Right. You know? So you're listening to this song, you hear this song, it it suddenly, you know, clicks into a coincidence. So uh, yeah, sorry, carry on from there. Yeah. So, you know, I, the, you know, this, this whole thing with depression went on for months and I just got so tired of it. I hit, I had reached this point. I I'd read several of Atkinson's books, like, um, uh, the life beyond death, where he talks about what happens to you after you die. And I thought to myself, how can someone even know this? How is that <laughs> even possible that someone knows this, you know? Uh, and, you know, and a, the whole idea about the mental universe really bothered me too, because I thought, how can you know that either? How could you, how could you ever prove that, you know, scientifically? It's very uh, difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I thought to myself, you know, I don't know what good that is thinking that because you could never know that for yourself, could you? You know? Um, but uh, so, you know, I, I, as painful and as weird as this all was, I knew that it was significant and I knew that I had to get to the bottom of it. 
right? There were things that stood out to me that I had read in Jacques Vallée's books. There was one experience where he talks about these people who have this kind of religious experience, right? And, and they are uh, going up to this mountain and uh, they run into these entities that bring them in their craft. And one of them starts describing this object that's made of gold, you know, and he hands it to her and she says, well, I know what gold looks like. And it's not transparent. This thing you handed me looks like glass, you know. And he said, well, there is such a thing as gold that's so pure you can see through it. And he's like, it's in your Bible. <laughs> and that stood out to me. And I was like, well, where is that in the Bible? You know, I don't, I wasn't familiar with the Bible at all. Um, so I started looking for it in the Bible. And I found it in the book of Revelation. And so I, I started to think to myself, you know, the book of Revelation is such a crazy thing. It doesn't make any sense. All I right. have to figure out what it means, you know. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I made a note of that. Um, and I went on about my experiences. And um, I got to the point that I was just so tired. I, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't. You know, I, I'm not sleeping this has been going on for months and I don't understand where it's going. Uh, it's been creepy. You know, I've, I've got these non-human entities in my room at night. So I just, I decided that I was just done. I was going to stop. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm going to throw all these books by Atkinson. I'm going to take them and throw them in the garbage tomorrow. I got to stop this, you know, because this is going to kill me. Uh, so that night I woke with that heavy feeling and, um, I, I knew right away it was them. Uh, and I just, I really just wanted to be left alone. Um, so I was kind of angry mm. that they were now waking me up again after that, you know? Uh, and there, so I, I'm like starting to open my eyes. My room is blurry and I'm kind of fighting to see what, is standing in front of me and I'm looking across my nightstand and there's this little man standing there. He's probably about three feet tall. He looked like uh, a yard gnome, I guess he had like a beard and like locked beard and hair. Uh, and he was like all white and he was wearing these big, thick black glasses. Yeah. It was odd. Wow. And <laughs> So I'm looking at him and I could see in the glass, there was like some kind of a red glow. The glasses were some kind of technology or something. I don't know what the purpose was, but I could see something was red and glowing inside them. And I could kind of see like the, the edge of his nose and the glow of the, the redness in, in the eyes. It was like, it was like the cherry on the end of a lit cigarette. Right. And so I'm looking at this and I'm like, what is going on? And this, this guy, he just says to me telepathically, he says, don't give up, keep going. Wow. <laughs> and then he puts me back to sleep. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and so I wake up the next morning and I thought, you know what? He must know something that I don't know, you know? So I guess I'll keep going. Um, and it's not, and, and, you know, I started thinking about, you know, how long this has been going on and how, you know, I can't just stand in the way of whatever this is, you know, whatever, whatever they're doing is significant. There's a point to it. I don't know what it is yet, but, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you poor man, how do you rationalize something like this? I mean, that is a real, yeah. that's, that's something to grapple with, especially, especially when you, I mean, obviously it's not exactly uh, visibly, you know, spiritual, but that's a difficult thing to grapple with as an atheist when you've when you've yeah. got this belief that hang on i don't believe in this kind of stuff and here it is yeah. coming into my life and and uh and that's that's a that's a slap to the face <laughs> yeah it is it was uh it was very difficult and i think that that was one of the reasons why i had such a hard time with this was because yeah. 
I just was not willing to accept that until it. And how do you, how do you explain that to people? Like, you know, how do you sit down and have a rational, like kind of calm conversation where you talk about like, you know, these beings like gnomes with goggles on staring at you in the night and stuff. I mean, that's, that's not, I mean, you know, you obviously are an intelligent man and, and, that's that's very difficult to grapple with i mean my my own experiences in relation to this are not on that level uh, although very vivid and i still struggle to kind of explain it and and i i get very conscious of the fact that people's eyes are starting to glaze over and they're going okay you know but that that <laughs> that's a you, you've taken it up a notch matthew yeah right yeah and so you know i i just kept going with all of this and um I I had decided at that point that, you know, I had to keep going, but Mm. this depression and this fear that was in me, because I, this fear was so awful. Like I would, these nightmares I would have, I would wake up to like the sound of a woman screaming in the house, you know, and there's no female living in the house. So, you know, it was just the footsteps, you know, banging on the walls in the middle of the night it was just so unsettling and i was just so tired of being constantly afraid and which so is strange because just... you're, you're getting encouraging messages from some of these things and yeah. it seems to kind of like come on keep going but at the same time you're having negative creepy <laughs> scary stuff like what the hell man yeah 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 and so you know, I decided that the only way I could continue is if I just decided that I wasn't going to be afraid anymore, Mm. you know, and just let go of it and let go of this idea that this depression is a bad thing and just let go of that. And so I did. And, um, that was when everything changed. Like Mm. it was, it was, it was, instantaneous almost i had this just immediate moment of clarity that you know everything in my life was a result of my emotional state of mind you know and that my emotions were mine alone and and no one else was responsible for them you know even fear sadness anything i didn't have to feel anything i didn't want to you know and that was all up to me um and so yeah that was when everything started to change and my experiences became you know kind of something else uh well um you know look talking about looking for a reason for all of this weird duality of uh you know positive messages and and, and terrifying scenarios i guess i mean it's almost it's almost impossible to really articulate the the full reason for that but it would seem that at least some aspect of that was to get you over fear get you yes. over that fear yeah yes absolutely and you know, one of the things that I've been looking at in terms of neurology is that, mm. uh, you know, when we have these fear experiences, they they actually will turn switches on and off in our DNA. Right. And those become embedded in our DNA. And so when you decide that you're going to get rid of fear and you're not going to feel it anymore, I would imagine that that would also do the opposite and switches would be thrown. And so <laughs> in doing that and in letting go and knowing that I had this immediate moment of clarity, I think was actually a genetic thing that happened within my brain and hmm. within the neurons in my brain. And so I, I, uh, I, I kept going with that. And, you know, I started to have these just really crazy religious experiences, like one... I came home from work one day and I felt so heavy. I was so tired. Like I I realized you're going to go to sleep whether you like it or not, like right now. So you better get to your bed. It was, it was to the point that I I ran in the house and I was running up the stairs (laughs) to get to my bed. And I just kind of jumped onto it. And like, I fell right into this dream where I was, uh, like floating through the sky and I was attached to with a cord to this little man that I had seen in my room, this yard dome guy. 
And like we landed at where I work out front of O&I, like um, by the flagpoles. And there was this dead beetle that I had seen a few days earlier that was like as big as my fist. It was like the biggest dead beetle I've ever seen in my life. And so he's standing there at the base of the flagpole and he's pointing it at it and he's looking at me and he doesn't say anything, you know? Um, and I thought, okay, well, that's significant, whatever that is. Uh, and I later looked that up in terms of mythology and it's like a symbol of death and resurrection, you know? Um, and so then we go into the space where I work and uh, I assumed we were heading to my desk because we were going through this sea of cubicles um, in my work center. And um, we pass by this desk that belongs to a coworker of mine. And I looked around and I noticed that the little man had disappeared and there was this older woman sitting at this desk. And um, it was the desk of a coworker of mine. And his grandmother had just passed away. Sorry, this uh, it gets really emotional. Um, but she all right, take your time. She stood up as I approached her and she said, Have you seen my grandson? And I said, Yes, I've I've seen him, you know. And she says, Well, how is he? You know, and I said, He's gonna be just fine. Um, and so then I told her it's time to sleep now because that was what I had read about in William Walker Atkinson's books that you go into this stage of slumber. Real and quick. Did, did, I, did I miss something? How were you familiar with her grandson? Was this like, so he, he worked with me. Oh, right. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. And I, I knew that she had passed away a couple of months ago because he went right. on leave. And so I knew okay. all of that was happening and that was a ha happening at the same time I was reading this book, the life beyond death. Okay. Right, right, right. And uh, so, you know, uh, I said, it's time to sleep now. And she nodded and like handed me her hand and this like wall of light just opened up and I kind of walked her into it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that mm -hmm. happened. <laughs> but, you know, it matched everything that William Walker Atkinson wrote in that book. And I was like, this is how he knows, you know, this is how he knows what this looks like and, and isn't um, that isn't that frustrating because you know you you've had experiences again i've had experiences we're in slightly different veins but came to extremely similar conclusions isn't it so frustrating how unbelievably subjective and personal and unquantifiable this kind of thing is because <clears throat> it's so yeah. difficult to translate it out to a very analytical logic-based reason like skeptic who's just like very materialistic yeah. it's it's so palpable, it's so real, it's so personally life-changing, but at the same time, it's just basically impossible to translate unless someone's already of the same opinions as you. If they're right. not, then it's like, it, it's, I, you know, it, it's just so difficult to have a conversation about this kind of stuff. Right, yeah, and you know, the skeptics, they, 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 they like to take experience out of everything yeah right yeah. if it, if it's experiential then well it just it doesn't just exist unreal, yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and that's their opinion of it but the the thing is you'll never know this stuff unless you experience it, i know right? that's the catch 22 yeah. yeah yeah and so um yeah and that's that's that was the big eye opener for me is that the only way to know is to experience it and so i kept going with all of this and kept reading and, you know, Mabel Collins and William Walker Atkinson, they always talk about this calm that follows the storm. And I wasn't sure what they were talking about. They were talking about this, this storm that overcomes the soul, you know. Mm. And but then, you know, I, I was driving home a few days after that experience and I was just like, what am I supposed to do with all of this? You know, what, where is this going? You know, because by this time it was we were heading into spring you know, and this had been going on from like the autumn until the spring. And so I'm driving down the road and then I hear this voice in my head that says, you're to act as a shepherd of men. And I was like, no, I was Oh, like, so not, not too intense then. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I was like, no, I, I reject that 
outright you right. know um and then the voice said but there's not much time and i thought to myself what do you mean there's not much time am i gonna die and the voice said yes and then she and then i was like instantly somewhere else uh, you know as i'm driving down the freeway and suddenly i'm driving at night through this intersection and there's like all these police sirens and stuff and i'm like being pursued right and so i'm headed through this intersection and this car comes up at a high rate of speed and just t-bones me oh crap right? and it's like slow motion and i can i can see the car like ripping through the cab and the glass wow. hitting me in the face and then all of a sudden it's over you know, and now I'm back driving down the freeway home from work. And, you know, my thought when I was faced with that was like, I don't really care. You know, I, I, cause I know that death is not final at this point, having had these experiences, you know, I was like, oh, well, if that's what it's going to be, that, that's what it'll be, you know? And so as I'm, as I'm getting off the freeway, all of a sudden this feeling hits me. I uh, I can feel like the emotions of everyone around me. You know, it hits me like a ton of bricks. Uh, I can feel the trees, the grass. I can feel the bugs in the grass. And it was just really overwhelming at the time, you know, because it, it just was unexpected and just all of a sudden. And then that kind of faded as I drove home. But it immediately I was like that's it you know that's how you know that there's a singular consciousness for everything because I just felt that you know um and so you know I kept going and then gradually that feeling started to happen all the time and then suddenly I was in like the best mood of my life. I was like in the best mood I've ever been in, in my entire life. And, you know, I read this passage where this woman is talking about nirvana or enlightenment. And she said, it's, it's the creator. Um, and he shuts all the doors of suffering and you suffer nothing. And that was really literally what I felt like like nobody could change my mood. I, I swear that a bomb could have gone off next to me and I wouldn't have even reacted or flinched. You know, I was so relaxed, like all of the tension had left my body. I was walking differently, more balanced. You know, my posture had changed. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was like, this is Nirvana. This is what this is, you know? And then there was like this final ceremony, like I, I was being taken from my bed, that same experience with the female voice says, shh, don't be afraid, you know? And I woke up from that and I was laying on a table and there were these beings that radiated white light that were like standing around me and they were looking down at me and they were talking to each other. Um, and then I fell back asleep and then I woke up again and I was standing um, in front of them in this temple, right? And they were like shoulder to shoulder, like five or six of them. And then one of them steps forward and he says, this life you have doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the human race. And you're to act as a shepherd of men. And then he talked to me about, you know, purpose and mission and uh and then he put me back to sleep and i woke up in my bed the next morning and i was like wow that was like that's it that this is it you know this was the point of all of this to have this awakening into what's called nirvana or enlightenment and there were you know there were all kinds of things that when i was in this state just would stop me dead in my tracks and i would be like what is that you know because i I could now feel like these universal forces. I could just feel them that I didn't know existed before. You know, like I, I could feel like these forces just like whipping around me and not affecting me, but I could feel them affecting other people around me and other things. Uh, but they weren't interacting with me anymore. I was like in a bubble, 
Hmm. Um, it was, it was very odd. It was an odd experience. How do you, how do you, <clears throat> how do you feel about uh, the whole kind of shepherd of men prophetic kind of, <laughs> because, well, you, you know, because you, you, you come across as a very reasonable guy. And I, I think that there is, I, I personally believe, and this is just in, in the realms of personal belief that there probably are, uh, you know, souls who have come down for very specific reasons and have, you know, something they wanted to achieve in this life. I think all of us in our own individual ways have got our own path. And, um, you know, you don't, you, you, you haven't given me that warning vibe of, oh God, this guy's got a Messiah complex, like he's yeah, going right. to save the world. But how right. do like, honestly, how do you feel about that kind of thing being told to you? Um, you know, at first I kind of was like, you know, no, I, I re- it sounds too biblical. It's just, yeah, it makes me uncomfortable, but you know, I, I have since done a lot of research into this kind of thing and you know, I'm not the only one who's been told that. Yeah. That, that's, I think that's just anyone who goes through this, like that's kind of your job. You now have to help other people mm-hmm. reach the state. And that's, that's what I view it as. It's, it's just you know, it's not that I'm not Jesus or anything like that. Um, I, I was, I'm really, I'm really glad you gave me that answer. <laughs> <That's the> answer. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, you know, I, in looking into this and in the mythology and stuff, like, you know, you see pharaohs in Egypt mm. and they're buried with shepherding tools. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think this is why, because, you know, this is something that they've always told people who have reached this state. Right. Know? It's, 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 it's almost like uh, everyone has the capability of being a shepherd, but not everyone becomes a shepherd. Like if they yeah. get to that level, it's suddenly like, oh, hello, you popped up into our world. Would you like to know that you're actually capable of helping mankind and all this? It's like, whoa, right. I've popped into some very strange <laughs> reality here, but it's like yeah. once you reach a certain level, something comes to meet you and uh, is excited that you've you've broken through almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think that, you know, I I was looking at the Eleusinian mysteries and right. Eleusinian Greece, and I and I kind of realized that, oh, that's what the mysteries were. They were this this experience, you know. Right. Well, these these are like the kind of like the Greek temples of old psychedelia yeah. and uh, potions and drinking and going into trance states and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, so there was uh, the the central myth to that is the uh, I, I found in the Homeric hymn to the goddess Demeter, and the goddess Demeter, of course, is a goddess of the harvest. Mm. Um, and she, she, what what happens with her? The important thing about the myth it, it's it's very long, but uh, she comes across this family. They're kind to her, um, and so in order to repay this family's kindness towards her, she decides she's going to turn their youngest boy into an immortal god, right? So she, to do this, she places him in a fire to burn like a log every night um, and gives him the, you know, uh, incantations and coats his body and ambrosia and stuff like that. And so there's never a, there's never a streamlined approach to this stuff, is there? <laughs> right, right. So, but but I, I realized, you know, that's kind of what I went through. I was put right. into a fire and burned mm. like a log every night. And and she says she's she's doing this to burn away his mortal soul and <laughs> turn him into an immortal god. Because that's one of the things you realize, you know, that you're just this soul, right? And and you will have many different bodies. Um and that's just what this is <laughs> that's what the universe is that's that's my inclination for sure yeah and so uh you know and and, and i think that that's that's the myth that describes this process right Cause, right because it's right. never the same for everybody no these these are personalized experiences but you are placed in this fire and you are burned like a log it's also in, also known as the dark night of the soul you know yes, the idea exactly. that you go through a journey yeah trials and tribulations Um, yeah and so you know and i I, in looking at it too um demeter there are some side myths where she has a son and her son is a shepherd Mm -hmm. and and so you know that kind of plays into this whole thing too yeah um and, and he teaches humanity how to harvest crops how to do the harvest and to me, what what they're saying there is they're, they're they're teaching people how to do this harvest of souls, you know that that happens because when I had, you know that that 
blue being, that female in my room, when I awakened into this nirvana or enlightenment, I had another experience with her. Uh, I, I woke up in my room and my arms were crossed underneath me and I was like laying on my arms on, on my face and I couldn't open my eyes and I felt that heaviness and uh, I heard a voice say, open your hand. So I opened my hand and I felt this small arm and hand placed in my hand and I was feeling it and it felt like the same skin as that blue female. And I was like, oh, this is a baby is what this is, you know? And so I, I was feeling, and it, its fingers were much longer than normal human fingers would be. So it was, it was almost like Kermit the Frog. Have you ever seen his hand? And I was got these tiny, long fingers. That's what it was like. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I feel this hand being pulled away and I felt like this static electricity around my hand. It was like static. And I just then I heard this voice say, so you can come back to us. And I was getting these impressions of like particle entanglement right. and, and reincarnation. And uh, so that was when I realized, oh, that's what all of this is. This is how they, my DNA is now with them. And that's because William Walker Atkinson, one of the things he says is you always reincarnate to your highest potential. And my DNA with them is now evidence of my new highest potential, right. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that I was like, that's what this is now. You know, that's now I understand, you know. <laughs> and, and to me, that's like where this whole idea of heaven comes from, right? Because I know, I know what psychologically what I had to do to reach this state. Um, in that my, uh, my whole life I've been practicing, I, I didn't even realize it was a thing, but I had been practicing stoicism, right? And I just kind of viewed it as a simplification of my mind in that I could, I could decide what I was going to feel. Right. And I, I didn't have to be jerked around by my emotions. Okay. You know, I didn't like the idea that people could play Lucky on you. my emotions. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so I, I decided, you know, that that's how I would control myself. And I went about my life in a very emotionally and mentally controlled, thoughtful way, you know. So you could almost say meditative. Yes, I was, I was constantly uh, very introverted mm. and introspective always. Mm. Um, you know, things would happen in my life and then I would think, how could I have handled that better? And mm. I, would be, I would be brutally honest with myself. You know, I had no problem doing that. Um, but I, I knew that that was what kind of enabled me to get to where I am today. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, <laughs> I, I like to read when, whenever I'm looking up information about this. I don't like to read a lot of modern authors. I like to read, you know, like Ovid, Plato, yeah. um, Plutarch just a ancient sources because to me those things are time tested right right um so you'll never hear me talking about oh you know frequency and that's such a wonderful frequency that you vibrate on or whatever yeah I, not I like so to much talk the new age lingo yeah i i like to talk about it in terms of psychology and things that you can actually apply to your own life um and one of the reasons I was able to do that is because I had this other experience where I was having this dream uh, after I had awoken. And uh, I, there was this older gentleman sitting across from me and he was teaching me about human psychology, right? And I was asking him questions. He was answering me. Um, I kind of wrote down notes from the conversation when I woke up, but as I was waking up, I had this name, Robert Moore running through my head. So I thought, hmm, maybe this guy wrote some books. Uh, I'll have to check this out. So I found a Robert Moore who was a Jungian psychoanalyst and he lived in Chicago. Uh, and so I started reading his books. Uh, and one of the first books I read was a book called the archetype of initiation. 
And it was then that I realized what I had been through was an initiation. I was like, oh, the Kabbalion by the three initiates. Yeah. And, and this guy wrote a book, The Archetype of Initiation. But he also wrote quite a few books about the archetypal mind, right? And, and how that works. And this is this to me is the most important part of this. Um, and just to give you an idea of how this works, like there's these four archetypes in the mind, right? There's the king, lover, uh, um, king, lover. I can't, <laughs> I can't remember all of them. But they, so when they're uh, when they when they function in their fullness, right? When you when you're at, at their fullest extent in the psyche, uh, they comprise the hero or the savior right and so when these things uh working in their fullness uh comprise the hero this is when you have this internal awakening right but if you are someone who is an extroverted person um you will seek that hero outside yourself right, right. so you'll have the, and and people always wonder well how could nazi germany happen why why did they why, why did people love Hitler so much? And this is why, because they, they, they were extroverted and they were looking for their savior, right? I and mean, rather than looking within, they looked without. Right, know? right. Also, and, just, to, just to jump in with the archetypes, king, lover, warrior, magician. Yes, yeah. Right. And so he wrote, so uh, Robert Moore wrote uh, a book for each of those. Um, and, and they're wonderful books. I, I, I love them to death. Uh, and he has just hit the nail right on the head with those books in terms of human psychology. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much my journey. Um, wow. That's a profound journey, Matthew. I mean, you know, like I said, <laughs> I've, I've, I share, I share some similarities with your experiences but uh in terms of the the vividness and the direct messaging i i i have not i've had vivid visual exhibitions of things that have turned up in my sky and even yeah. uh you know to briefly give you an idea i've had uh, literally above this room just outside there is my back garden and uh, I was outside in my garden, and uh, I've had I've had three orange orbs of light come down and 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 hover above the roof of my house and uh, fly away afterwards. So I can I'll, I won't go into it too vividly, but I've had uh, four different experiences with these orange orbs of light, and all of this came from a previous journey of things clicking into place. Um, because my my experiences were. Uh, consciously initiated i was outside after coming to us because i was not a ufo guy i kind of got thrown into this through my own strange journey and it it, it clicked yeah. into the point where i i was i believed that i was able to make this type of contact uh through my mind through meditative states and so i was outside in, in a meditative state kind of resonating the intention of something coming and, and seeing me lo and behold it did and that changed my life so i've got similarities with you in that regard but not i've never had direct communication i've never had any sort of uh, you know physical beings appearing what do you think is going on <laughs> because th is this just extraterrestrial from a planetary body out in the solar system or the you know the universe or is this something above something you know spiritual we can call it ultra dimensional extra dimensional like where are you sitting right now on this um so you know where i'm sitting i i kind of think that uh you know if if you if you were a race of beings that had had this kind of awakening right and all of you have gone through it um then you would certainly be aware of much more of this type of thing than we would. And if, and if you think about it, how would a race like that have children? You know, if, if you were just these immortal, right. Beings, you couldn't like, you couldn't have kids the same way we do where we think that we have this child and this is the first time this child has ever experienced the world. Um, so what you would do is you would raise these centers of consciousness or these souls um, 
and that I think is what they're doing. Um, we are their children. What gets me is it's it's the inserting of events into someone's life. How do you generate events? I mean, you know, I can oh, understand I a disc coming down from the sky. I can even, in some way, understand orange orbs floating above the roof of my house. You know, oh my gosh, it's something. But an, yeah. an event? I mean, like, it's the same for me. Because, I, you know, all of everything that happened to me was the result of a twisty, turny road of the dark night of the soul kind of thing, depression, trauma, spiritual realization through books, which then led to coincidental experiences which related back to those books. Like when I had these experiences with the orbs, it was all connected to, uh, for me personally, a series of books called Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, I've never um, heard of it. Yeah, those books changed my life personally. Um, they were the they were the catalyst for me. But this is the thing. It's like for me, I was at one point basically, you know, praying uh, one night, not praying in, in a religious sense because I've I've never been a very religious person, but just kind of speaking to the universe and saying, "Hey, look, I need something in my life. I, you know, I need something to change. I need." And at this point, I've been reading up about consciousness studies. This is before I got involved in UFOs at all. You know, I just yeah. kind of I'd gone through a depression. My dad, funnily enough, recommended me these books, Conversations with God. I read them. They had a profound effect on me. And then this led to me kind of like falling into consciousness studies, which then essentially uh, for me, what happened was after this depression state, I started learning about different ideas around consciousness, both from a spiritual perspective and also from more of an academic kind of quantum mechanics perspective. So I had these two, two kind of models uh, coinciding. And then my friend uh, recommended uh, a, a documentary literally a week after I'd been sitting on this very bed and saying, look, I, I need something to change because the way that I felt at the time was that I'd amassed all of this, in my opinion, understanding of uh, of consciousness and the universe and life and death and you know I had all these ideas but I was like I don't know what to do with this I just feel like I know stuff that maybe not many other people know and what do I do what do I do with that and so I was sitting on my bed this one one night and I just said like I need something in this life that is that correlates to what I've been learning that I can do that can that can happen in this physical world otherwise it's all just kind of abstract concepts you know yeah and uh so i was sitting on my bed and then literally a week later my my best friend shows me this documentary and like you know it's relatively controversial and for good reasons uh unacknowledged dr stephen greer obviously there's a lot of controversy around stephen greer and ce5 which again to a certain extent i can understand because of the kind of capitalistic profiting and, and all of that yeah. however um I had no idea about UFOs at the time. I hadn't really given it any thought, but I had given consciousness a lot of thought, had asked yeah. for something to come into my life. And then the next thing I was shown was this guy saying, hey, you can use consciousness to actually initiate some sort of contact scenario. So that was why I ended up in my back garden doing this thing. And then I had these experiences with Orange Orb. So I've had these like, you know, crazy synchronicities all coalesce together, uh, which formed what I decided to create a Project Unity about, you know, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it's, it's the fact that just to take it back to my original point, which I was asking you about, it's the fact that events can be placed into your life. It's like, is this, you know, is that a technology? Or is this what people would call angels or something you know it's it's too i don't i can't wrap my head around it yeah yeah and i i just kind of feel like you know they 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 know a lot more about the conscious oh universe. for sure we, we come into this awakening and you know someone told me oh well how is it that you don't know everything about you know the conscious universe if you've experienced it and i and i kind of liken it to like an explorer right an explorer that has come to some new land and they've arrived on the beach mm. right that doesn't mean that they've mapped out they've got the map yeah <laughs> yeah and th that doesn't mean that they know every species of animal and yeah plant that this is new there. terrain new environment right. and, and so i say you know i'm just the explorer that has just arrived yeah. You know, I and that's really what is happening with us when we're when we go through this awakening. There is so much more to this. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I kind of I like you, I think I kind of believe that a lot of this is mental. And so like with the blue female in my room, she could mentally induce that state in me. Yeah, possibly. Um, yeah. That state of paralysis mm. and that 
maybe technology isn't needed in something like that. They can just do it with just kind of a thought. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I think about this, like I wonder, because I mean, I, I, I also wonder if we're perhaps dealing with a spectrum. So, you know, maybe there yeah. is uh, an alter interdimensional side and then there's maybe some physical body ETs from other planets and maybe there's different subsections of this and and different, yeah. uh, you know, different things happening. But uh, yeah, the, the the consciousness aspect, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if it was more to do with uh, technologies that enhance consciousness yeah. finally tune it allow it to be something very novel that we're not really familiar with in terms of technology and it, it you know it makes me think about where we're going because i personally believe that there needs to be some sort of symbiosis between what we call spirituality or metaphysics and science you know like these yeah. two things do not need to be bifurcated they need to be correlated they need to be intertwined in some way uh -huh. and it's difficult for people to get to that point because we're still uh, you know, in the spiritual sense, we're either bogged down by dogma and very rigid religious barriers that people don't really believe in these days as much, or it's mm. very new age, get your crystals out, you know, like, and it's, it's very difficult for people to realize, but I kind of have this feeling that through the emergence and progression of things like quantum theory and, and the development of looking into the substructure of reality, the framework, the, like the, the most basic components, that's how we might be able to get to this new point. I feel like there's maybe like a spiritual resurgence coming, but it's coming through the medium of technology. It's being translated in a different way now so that people of a modern era, a technological era, can have a framework to kind of place this in, which isn't just about, you know, burning bushes and Ten Commandments and, and things like that, not abstract ideas, but it's like, here is a science to spirituality. And I kind of have yeah. a feeling that's where we're going, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, that's, that's kind of what I wanted this to be when I started to look into it. I, I wanted to kind of nail this down, mm. you know? Uh, and, and so, you know, and I, I think I kind of did a little bit in that, uh, you know, I, I understand kind of the, the psychology that got me here, which can be studied by science. Yeah. Um, and also the fact that, you know, this is a cycle. It's a natural cycle within the human psyche that this happens every year. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and a lot of people don't understand what depression is, but most people experience depression in the dead of winter. Mm. And I realized in my own experiences, and I've since kind of confirmed that through mythology and stuff, that when these religions are describing death and resurrection, a lot of people think, oh, well, this is just to do with crops, you know, the death of living things right, in right, the winter right. time, and then the resurrection in the spring. But they were actually talking about this experience that I had, mm. and this was the death and resurrection of like the lower self see that that's something that i uh it, it frustrates me because a very skeptical materialistic person is going to view all of these ideas right. from the past of like you know multiple gods or the spirit of the water or something anything like that as oh they just didn't understand the world correctly now yes. we understand the yeah. world correctly so we can you know do away with all of these different gods and stuff but maybe that's not right. Maybe that's not right at all. And we're just in a different model now. We've gone up into a different model and that might not be representative of the entirety of reality. And, and I do have a feeling that maybe there's more to take from the archaic beliefs of our, of our ancestors in relation to you know, consciousness and mind and maybe even you know, deities and, and different beings. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, this this idea that we have that religion or spirituality and science are two separate things is mm. a relatively new thing. Mm. Oh, uh, it is. It's Newtonian physics, yeah. basically. Right. So for throughout most of human history, those two things have been linked. Yeah. Um, and they've been linked because we kind of knew this, right? Yeah. We, we, <laughs> we knew about this experience and about how there's this link between these two. And mm. And now for some reason, there's this kind of uh, want to separate the two and it just doesn't work that way. Like what, you, can, uh, you, know, you can blame Descartes for that. Yeah. And yeah. So one of the things that I in looking at the book of Revelation, I kind of looked at it through, OK, well, what is this really saying? You know, and then I realized that my, my father's an astronomer. Mm. So I'm, I'm familiar with 
constellations in the sky and things like that. And so I, I started looking at it through that perspective and I realized, okay, this, this book is telling me um, that it, it, what it does is it lays out everything it describes are constellations in the sky, right? And it starts out talking about the constellations that frame the path of the sun from the autumnal equinox to the winter solstice. Right. And so I thought, well, why would it do that? Um, and then I read this book by Mabel Collins that's called uh, When the Sun Moves Northward, The Way of Initiation. And that's in that book, she really kind of lays it out and says, you know, that this time of the autumn into winter and then the spring, this is when the initiation takes place and this all the world's religions are just describing that right um and so i thought wow that is just really amazing you know that that we can look at these these ancient texts and kind of read them that way and that that's what i like to do i like to read them that way yeah in, in terms of the context of this yeah um because plato clearly wrote about it plutarch wrote about it ovid wrote about it um I mean, there's, it's just really amazing stuff, you know? Absolutely. And it gets, it gets lost in translation or changed over time and, and misinterpreted. And, and, you know, as we were saying with uh, the a very recent change in the way that we view the world, um, a brilliant example of, of kind of the irony of this situation is something that I, I learned about recently. So like the godfather, one of like basically the godfather of modern uh, materialism and rationalism is Rene Descartes, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the philosopher. But do you know how he founded modern materialism and rationalism? No. Uh -uh. An angel came to him in the night and said to him, the conquest of nature is to be achieved through measure and number. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's basically that one of the founders of modern day rationalism and materialism was told that by an angel. So yeah, yeah. what 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 is this built on? This new <laughs> rational behavior we have, you know, it's built it's built on a prophetic uh, messages from interdimensional beings. So I mean, you know, <laughs> where does that leave the rationalists and materialists? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, and, and a PhD, the idea of a, getting a PhD. Um, was something that was started in these like Neoplatonic schools where right. they were, where they were teaching this awakening. Um, and, and it suddenly, and for, for whatever reason, like it turned into something that it is not today. It was, yeah. it used to be like a, a certificate of the soul that you have like mastered the soul. Um, and, and that was what a PhD was, but today it's something completely different. Um, and it has nothing to do with that, you know, and yeah. that's really unfortunate, I think. It is unfortunate, but I suppose if we're going to look at it in the perspective of there are no coincidences, this must be a vital part of the human journey of yeah. development. You know, it's a moment yeah. of ignorance before we go out into a, a moment of enlightenment, uh, I think at least to some degree. Yeah. And uh, you know what, um, this actually makes me want to ask you a question, so that, you know, the, the current mainstream narrative in relation to UFOs, right? Many people are concerned that the US government is focusing on, on the threat potentiality too much. I mean, for me, from my perspective, this would be the only plausible way in which the US government and its you know defense apparatus could respond to this issue, despite my extremely high suspicions that some level of the government or private sector is in is in possession of uh, you know uh, more information that provides more insight into the nature of uh, this mm. issue than is being allowed to come out into the public arena despite this i can i can still understand why the mechanisms of government are having to address this issue under the banner of a potential threat but nevertheless how do you feel about the way in which the ufo issue is being addressed especially because you yourself have had these very intimate experiences with the phenomenon. Right. I mean, it's, it's literally black and white in terms of how it's being dealt with and how you've experienced it. Well, I think, you know, and I, I I've said this to people who bring up that threat mm. narrative is that, mm. uh, what I, what I think is happening and I can tell you having worked at ONI, I worked at the command that was the birthplace of this task force. So, I, I know some of these folks yeah. uh, and in my opinion, 
the 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 threat narrative is to get people to pay attention that's what i would say as well uh i i don't think that everyone necessarily views this as a threat but if you tell people oh this is all gumdrops and lollipops and you don't have to worry about it you know no congressman or senator is even going to look at that no right if there's no issue here i don't even want to know about it you know what i mean and I, th- I think that that is what has been part of the problem. Yeah. Maybe. And so, so you have to kind of imply that, well, this could be a threat. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. you should look at it. Dance around it. Yeah. And so I, I think that that's what's happening. So do that, you, do, but do you feel like that's just based on, you know, obviously you've had these very personal experiences, which are very different to how it's being addressed. Do you um do you still feel like this is probably the best and only way that this could happen? Are you are you happy with how it's being with how it's being rolled out and where it might go? Uh I'm I I'm as happy as I can be about it. I think that I, I'm kind of disappointed that more people aren't interested in this. Oh my god, tell me like, about it. <laughs> it seems but, like there mate, are so at, least, many- at least your country's reporting on it, trust me. Over here in, in Britain, <laughs> there's like tumbleweeds in the media just floating by (laughs) yeah yeah i mean and i i don't understand the just total disinterest that some people have Um, i think i think it comes down at least in my mind to either so much stigma that it's basically just indoctrinated into people for them to have a knee-jerk shrug it off their shoulders i don't need to be bothered with this kind of thing or it just scares the shit out of them you know yeah yeah i that that could be i mean i i remember there was a a popular morning tv news show here uh that did a little piece on this and they showed like kind of the gimbal footage Mm. and then this kind of very famous morning news reporter was sitting there and she kind of just said well she was a little bit shocked by what she had just seen and she thought well you know i just i don't want to know you know and on with the news you know <laughs> <laughs> like she she wants nothing to do with it you know <laughs> honestly honestly i know what's more terrifying the obvious uh problems with human nature or an unknown coming into our world i don't know personally i think humans are more terrifying <laughs> oh yeah yeah absolutely you know yeah you know because when i when i had this awakening experience i i had shut my tv off i had shut yeah. myself off from the world and the first time I turned on my TV after I awakened, I kind of had this uh, moment of realization as I'm watching these reporters on the news. I was like, this is like, they seem like children to yeah, me. Yeah. It's like, it's like Lord of the Flies down here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I could live in a world with no money and I, I could go to work just for the betterment of mankind and humanity and completely do away with the concept of money i would have no problem with that personally but i think a lot of the public would just not knowing what i know they would lose their minds well that's uh, the problem that. isn't it it's the it's it's the fact that for for whatever reason even though i do believe that everyone has these abilities in consciousness the abilities to interact with other intelligences like i was saying before it's just whether or not you realize you've got those abilities it's it's very you know it's affecting people in this strong way like you or like me or others it is very specific it's, this is not across the board this is not happening to you know thousands and thousands and thousands of people on mass or at least they're not talking about it uh, you know, that could yeah. be the case. There could be drastically higher numbers of people having crazy prophetic experiences and they're just too afraid to speak about it. But um, we're, I mean, we're, we're coming up on two hours. So we might have to cut it in a, in a sec, but I'm, I'm really enjoying this. So I'm trying to get the most out of it. Um, do you it's, it's idealistic, but do you do you think that um, do you think that we could be in an age of enlightenment, that we could be moving towards some sort of m- complete paradigm shift and maybe these things in our skies are a part of an initiatory experience like this not just for you but for the whole world eventually yeah i you know i would love to think that i would love to think that but uh at the same time you know within my experiences it it made 
it made human psychology just very transparent and it, it's almost like synesthesia you know in, in that kind of a way i can i can kind of look at uh human society and kind of see where we are and i see how far away we are from this awakening on mass uh so i i i i don't want to say no but i i think that that's the journey's probably... looking like a long one <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah yeah it is it's looking longer and longer the more i look at it you know because i was when i first when this first happened to me i was very optimistic and i was like wow you know everybody can do this and then i just start looking at the world around me and i was like wow only about yeah. five people that i know are even close to this oh man you know say I mean? honestly same here like literally like what <laughs> before before i was doing these uh you know lovely professional interviews i was just putting a phone up in the forest and i was going to the forest in the middle of nowhere when i had these uh, orange orb experiences and things uh -huh. i was just like you know what i'm just going to set up a camera in the forest and i'm just going to talk about what this is and i'm going to tell everyone that they can do it as well and it's all possible <laughs> and you know and uh i still believe that there's a you know there's a capacity within everyone but again it's that level of realization and some people are just yeah. very far down on that scale and i you know i don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that it's like there's right. no there's no moral difference between a, a kindergartner and a, a graduate student you know there's no, there's no moral difference there it's just a difference in understanding but yeah it, you know based on kind of the way that you're seeing the world unfold it would seem to me at least that there is a, a lack of this kind of conscious stimulus which is why I look at it and I think to myself, well, perhaps because of the way we're going technologically, the only way for us to kind of save this spirit of, of humanity and, and this resurgence of these types of ideas might be through some new model in physics, some new expression in technology, because, you know, I, I, I can't see us unless we're hit by a meteor going back to you know tribal ayahuasca ceremonies and shamanistic kind of roots if we're going mm -hmm. to go through that and we're still going to go on the trajectory we're going on it's going to have to come through our technology through our science you know through our yeah. uh, innovation and uh, and i think that that might be the case but i you know i can't see what's on the horizon you know there's there's something yeah on the horizon in my opinion something we're moving towards how far how close i'm not sure but it just seems like we're building something maybe we're too inside the maze to see the the macroscopic picture of what humans are building like you know watching an ant in an in, a, in an ant colony you know yeah. does, does that single ant know that it's building a colony or, or do you need to be outside of that looking in to go ah it's building something maybe there's something looking at us and going hey these humans these humans are building something this is interesting we're going to keep watching <laughs> but we don't know we're just running around doing our thing you know it's yeah. it, it opens up so many questions and that's that's another thing i think i'm sure you'll probably agree with this the more you have these types of experiences or the more you feel like you know something, the more you realize just how much you don't know. It's actually, it increases the level of unknowing that you have by having a revelation like this. You know, for me, it's like, what are these orange orbs of light? What are you? What You came down and you visited me and you floated around my garden. And, uh, and that's just given me a, a, a thousand questions of what this could be. And, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy that, but at the same time, it's a, uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle because you can't talk to this, uh, you know, you can't talk about this with everyone and, um, you look around your life and I, you know, I get, I, I can imagine you must feel this because of the, the level of intensity for your experiences, but you look around your life and you look at people doing their daily jobs and you just think. I have had an experience that is magic, that is like yeah. totally not this world we're operating in. And all these people are just walking past. They have no idea. And I have those moments sometimes where I'm just like, oh my God, I've seen crazy shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so for for me, like uh, psychologically, and I was talking to another person who was an initiated person the other day and we were talking about how we see all this political polarization that's happening mm, and how yeah. that, that seems to be odd but we were talking about where that comes from and 
we kind of arrived at the conclusion that there is something happening with that, right? So you have people who are introverted and, and the more they go through this experience that we're talking about, this introverted awakening, right? We, we will destroy internally the things necessary, like things like fear, uh, we'll destroy those things uh, internally as necessary, but because there are more people who are going through this, it's causing this polarization because you have mm -hmm. people who are extroverted who take that energy and rather than focusing it inward, it becomes this outwardly destructive, violent behavior, mm -hmm. right? because uh, that, that's just the way it works. So, so I do see that there are more people going through this and it's causing this ripple effect in the collective human subconscious yeah. that is just causing this polarization and things like January 6th. I think we all realize that we want a big change mm. and we, we kind of feel this thing calling us. But, but we're not quite sure how to get it. Right. And, and the way that we react to that call mm. um, depends on whether or not we're an introvert or an extrovert. And the introvert will do the internal journey. The extrovert will then destroy everything. That's an interesting them. idea. I mean, to be yeah. fair, I, I mean, I, I guess to some extent, I might disagree with you just because I'm a relatively extroverted person. And uh, I I would see I'm kind of like I've I've become more introverted as I've got older and, and gone through certain experiences, but I'm definitely still a you know an extroverted person. I like going out and talking to people and socializing. And I think yeah. that that element of me is what created this platform, you know, to speak yeah. to to kind of push that stuff out into the world. And um, so I I see a component of that extrovertedness or you know, even ego, because there's a part of you that wants to talk and be heard and, and yeah, be listened yeah. to. Yeah. And you know, I can acknowledge that within myself. Um, so I guess it's uh, you know, a balance, right? Equilibrium right. It's about having a good balance between different forces like that. Well, I mean, so uh, when I when I say introvert and extrovert, I'm talking about like the Jungian definition, right? right. Um, and that's not necessarily the colloquial definition. Mm. So, so the introvert is someone who realizes that there is this world within mm. the inner right? world. They they understand the inner world and how that manifests in the outer world, and so they they will keep those things in balance yeah. and check. Yeah. And the extrovert thinks that everything that is real is what they can put their hands on which right? means they have to fight for it and hold on to right it. exactly and so they they like everything in to include their own emotions yeah. resides yeah. outside themselves right? right so so when they get angry they see well you made me angry yeah yeah and so instead of like controlling their own emotions they'll seek to control the people and things around yes. them in yeah, order yeah. to control their emotions. And it becomes this outwardly destructive, violent thing that they're Definitely. doing. Definitely. Um, and that's, that's what I see as, as the, as the issue. And, and, and that's what I mean when I say, I see this ripple effect through the human subconscious that's causing this outward yeah. Yeah. outburst, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, I totally resonate with that. And like, for me, I've kind of put it into my own little model of uh, essentially like left right hemisphere, uh, you know, yeah. in terms of if you have the ability to be grounded in the material world to the point where you're at least you acknowledge you're you're in it, you're in the material world for this experience, but you have that capability to move into more abstract, uh, creative concepts. I think that is that's a very good recipe for being able to understand this stuff or at least be maybe more receptive to experiences like this. If you have an analytical side to you, but there is that, that, that acknowledgement that there is something else, that there is something coming up from this. I mean, a good example of that would be uh, Nikola Tesla, you know, uh, one of the main pioneers of, of electricity because he he was obviously a, a a materialist in terms of his ability to create technologies and innovations but he himself and there's a brilliant quote i won't be able to do it verbatim but there's a brilliant quote where he says uh you know there is a there is a core that from which all creativity arises i'm i'm yet to discern the location of this core but i know it exists 
And that's kind of the idea of like, you can be grounded in this life. You can understand that you're in a physical world, having a physical experience and there's science and there's components and there's things to do, but this is all coming up, rising up from something else, generating this experience. And that's the mysterious, the consciousness, the creative unbounded consciousness kind of thing. And, uh, I, I think that we need maybe more people like that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 You know, and I, 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 something that I realized in this awakening was that anybody who's ever discovered anything mm. really big or important in terms of humanity has been through this. Yeah. Yeah. Because for sure. they leave, they'll leave like these quotes about spirituality right. or something. And you're just like, Oh, you know, <laughs> I <you> get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you see like everybody who you would consider to be a genius is somebody who has touched consciousness and touched source. Yes. Um, and, and people don't understand that no. they think, Oh, well, I'm just going to go, you know, take some physics classes and I'm going to be Albert Einstein. No, yeah. there's, there's much more to well, it. Well, it's like the idea of, you know, someone saying, oh, well, you know, Rene Descartes says it's this way. Yeah, but he's, he got told it by an angel, <laughs> you know? Like, right, yeah, exactly. No, you, you can't, yeah, the, every time you trace it back, there's something mysterious, something <laughs> strange arising from it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and I I see that creative aspect um, that manifests in humanity every day, and I see that this this change is like calling to us. And mm. I, there was there was someone that I thought was an initiate. Uh, I uh, have you ever heard of a band called uh, uh, My Chemical Romance? Oh yeah, of course, MCR, of course, man. Yeah, and and they have this song Helena, mm -hmm. right? And I used to listen to this song when I was a teenager, and I. I, I remember like it just it spoke to me on some level. And then after I went through this experience, I kind of revisited that song and I was like, oh, I see this whole death and resurrection thing throughout this song, you know, and you can see it in Tom DeLonge's music. Yeah. Uh, this whole death and resurrection theme and and this change that we have to go through. And I so I thought, wow, this guy who uh, is uh, the lead singer of My Chemical Romance must be an initiate. So I started looking. Mm -hmm. I started looking into his background and he had some severe depression, but he clearly hasn't gone through this yet. But he was tapping into that creative uh, collective human subconscious that was telling him this and so he <laughs> created this not even really wonder, knowing what it was i wonder if uh, i wonder if helena might be a shout out to uh helena blavatsky the russian philosopher because she was one of yeah, the founders of the theosophical that's society that's yeah, helena I, I don't know that that's yeah. that would be very interesting right but Little you know there's there's one scene where like he's like on his knees in this church and like mm -hmm. this woman is dead lying there and there's like these people around her just kind of like and it's like a beating heart and like mm. it's, it's almost like telling us that the way to consciousness is through this death you know um the only way to life is through death and mm. um, that's kind of like the whole theme of this death and, of the uh death of the ego death of yeah. the, the materially grounded mind yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and i just i see that manifest everywhere yeah you know? oh yeah absolutely <laughs> this is uh, matthew this has been a really cool conversation man yeah. like might have to might have to nip it in the bud now because it's getting a bit okay. late for me although i would i would happily have you back on to talk because this is you know for like like i said to you before and and you you know this already because you said that that's one of the reasons you wanted to have a chat with me is i like this kind of stuff this is what yeah. i like to talk about and you know i like to my I, my most recent interview was with frank milburn and bob mcguire all national security and you know kind of i i, I don't yeah. mind getting into that uh, it's kind of like what I was saying about left brain, right brain. I've got that right. side of me. I like seeing that. Yeah. I like talking about this. But really, there's a there's, my heart lights up when I'm talking about these weird ideas. Uh, mainly because <laughs> I, you know, I've had experiences, so I know it's not all just theoretical and abstract mm -hmm. and woo woo. Like there is something to this. I absolutely believe you with your experiences, and it's obviously had a profound effect on you. Um, and uh you know yeah i just want to say thank you for for taking the time to have a talk with me about all of this oh yeah thank thanks for having me i i, I loved this interview it was, it was one of the best i've ever done thank you oh, i'm, I'm glad to me. hear it and before <laughs> before we before we run off how can people get hold of your book 
Uh, yeah, so it's available on Amazon. I had to self-publish because I couldn't find anybody to publish this book. But, uh, <laughs> but it, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I well, I mean, you know, it's crazy. I would think that people would say, "Hey, oh, this yeah. guy at O and I, he was." I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why wouldn't you want to read this book? But uh, I don't know. So yeah, it's on Amazon. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so hopefully people will pick it up and enjoy it. Yeah, well, I highly recommend it, especially based off of the back of this conversation, because, uh, uh, you know, you seem like a very intelligent, very credible guy who's had some incredible experiences and uh, you're yeah. trying to grapple with that and you're trying to understand it. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many, there's so many people who are going through similar things, you know, maybe different circumstances, but the core concept of struggling to deal with something that has in, come into their life that's very different and uh, so I think you're speaking to a lot of people when you when you talk about these things and I, I definitely think my audience is going to appreciate this uh, this interview but yeah thank you uh, thank you Matthew so much for for taking this time and being here with me all right Jay thanks thanks for having me it was it was a great time mm -hmm.